Hello everyone. Today we will discuss about the pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. As you can see in this diagram, and I will discuss what is this uh, present, uh, picture represented exactly. So, what are the types of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis? So, like it is a rare disease. Okay, this is the rare disease. Now, it is characterized by myeloid cell dysfunction, progressive pulmonary surfactant accumulation, hypoxemia, innate immunodeficiency, and in some individuals, it can lead to serious infection, pulmonary fibrosis, respiratory failure, and finally, it can lead to death. Based on pathogenesis, it can be divided into three parts like primary, secondary, and congenital PAP. So, primary pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is caused by impaired GMCSF dependent clearance. So, here, like this factor, GMCSF will be impaired. And GMCSF dependent surfactant clearance will be impaired by alveolar macrophages and account for 90% of the cases. So, this is the like most common kind of uh, type of pulmonary artery proteinosis. Second one is secondary. Pulmonary artery proteinosis, which is the consequence of comorbid conditions like uh, those conditions which impair surfactant clearance by alveolar macrophages. It can include, it is a heterogeneous uh, group of diseases, so we will discuss it later. It includes like 5 to 10 percent of the cases. Third thing is congenital pulmonary artery proteinosis, which is more appropriately surfactant uh, metabolic dysfunction disorder, constitutes a clinically distinct and heterogeneous group of genetic diseases associated with acute uh, respiratory failure at birth from surfactant deficiency or dysfunction or progressive massive, uh, progressive massive uh, fibrosis, production of abnormal surfactant and varying degree of surfactant accumulation. So here like disorder will be related to mainly surfactant. So this is the main thing. Role of GMCSF in surfactant homeostasis, cellular stability, lung function and host defense we know. Like it is a very critical factor. Now we will discuss about uh, GMCSF, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. In 90% of the patient decrease GMCSF signaling to the alveolar macrophages which block their terminal differentiation in the lungs, their ability to clear surfactant and number of the other function. Like it used to stimulate the macrophages. So if GMCSF uh, is not there, so there will be no terminal dif differentiation of uh, macrophages. So this is like very critical thing. And uh, GMCSF is 23 kilo Dalton cytokine produced by respiratory epithelium and other cells to stimulate the formation of macrophage. So this factor used to stimulate the formation of macrophage and granulocyte colonies from hematologic progenitor and stimulate the function in mature myeloid. So GMCSF bind to cell surface receptor composed of GMCSF binding alpha chain uh, which has marker CD116 and affinity enhancing beta chain which have like marker CD131 and JAK2 ligand binding activate multiple intracellular signaling pathway including state 5 which regulate diverse function of myeloid cell. So like uh, they, uh, they are like some critical uh, proteins which are like uh, binding alpha chain uh, which has CD116 affinity enhancing beta chain which has CD131 and JAK2 and state 5 in primary fat Disruption of GMCSF signaling by neutralizing GMCSF autoantibodies. So it can be further divided into two parts, either hereditary or autoimmune. So in autoimmune condition, there will, there will be like formation of GMCSF autoantibodies, which is like very important thing. And in uh, hereditary one, there is like a recessive mutation in colony stimulating factor 2RA encoding GMCSF receptor alpha chain or CSF 2RB, which encode beta chain. So 2RA encode alpha chain or 2RB encode beta chain. A encode A, B encode B. Very simple. So this is hereditary. Now, uh, surfactant, we will uh, learn about surfactant. Surfactant is composed of 80% of the phospholipids, 10% of like most of the content is phospholipid only, and 10% of neutral lipids, primarily cholesterol, and 10% protein will be there. Like, these are very important proteins which are like surfactant protein A, B, C, and D. So, we should learn these things, and less than 1% of carbohydrate, like carbohydrate is in least amount. Surfactant proteins are surfactant protein A, B, C, and D. Now, surfactant protein B and surfactant protein C are hydrophobic, very, very important which are having last word B and C. So we will learn it by this thing like surfactant protein B and C are hydrophobic phosphoproteins that contribute significantly to the surface active properties of the surfactant. Very important. Now comes surfactant proteins A and D, which are hydrophilic in nature. So hydrophilic collecting family proteins are these proteins, uh, surfactant protein A and surfactant protein D, which used to help in lung host defense. Very important. Now surfactant lipid and protein are synthesized, stored and secreted into the alveoli by type 2 macro alveolar epithelial cells. So, which is very important thing. We know like alveoli has two type of epithelial cells, type 1 and type 2. So, whole work of type, uh, surfactant is done by type 2 alveolar epithelial cells and type 1 helps in the transmission of air. So, uh, surfactant large aggregate makes a thin film that reduces surface tension on the alveolar wall, stabilizing the alveoli, we know. Now, surfactant is expelled from the film as a small aggregate. So, uh, from the film, it used to form a small aggregate that are internalized by type 2 cells. So, type 2 cells used to make them and like again reuptake. Uh, it used to do reuptake of uh, surfactant also. And alveolar macrophage in roughly, uh, so like uh, reuptake is done by alveolar macrophages and type 2 epithelial cells, and which is in equal amount by both of them. 
So type two cells not appear to require regulation by GMCSF. We know like GMCSF is uh, requiring regulation of environmental macrophages, not type two cells. So this process will not hamper uh, of reuptake by type two cells. While macrophage uh, we know where micro macrophages are mediated by GMCSF. Now the critical cell type in the pathogenesis is myeloid. We know like macrophage is like very important thing, not the epithelial cells because GMCSF is disrupting here. So it used to disrupt the pathogenesis by myeloid or by macrophages only. Now disruption of GMCSF signaling axis. So like uh, what are the critical things? Most critical thing is like GMCSF, then PU point one. Then PPAR gamma and ABCG1. So these are the factors which are like most important to least important in the pathogenesis of the coronary artery proteinosis, uh, alveolar proteinosis. In the secondary pap, depletion of alveolar macrophages will be there, as we know, uh, by various diseases. And in congen congenital pap, disruption of gene, which require normal surfactant. We know like congenital is related to surfactant. So here like surfactant protein B, surfactant protein C, and ABCA3. These three genes are like proteins are very important, as we know. So now we'll uh, go ahead on. Uh, there is like uh, we know primary pep can be divided into two parts autoimmune pep and like hereditary pep so we will learn about autoimmune which is previously known as idiopathic so like we do not know previously like it has antibody auto antibodies that's why we used to tell that it uh, idiopathic utilizing it has in utilizing anti gmcsf antibody is very important auto antibodies uh, they are telling like these antibodies are polyclonal in nature so composed of igg subclass 1 2 1 and 2 are like uh, more important and in, with a smaller amount of igg 3 and 4 with high affinity for binding to gmcsf that's why they used to like uh, act on them. Level of GMCSF autoantibodies in PAP patient did not correlate with disease severity. Very, very important. So the level of autoantibodies do not correlate to the with the disease severity. So okay. So now we'll move ahead. Reproduction of PAP in non-human primates by injection of PAP patient derived GMCSF autoantibodies firmly established that their critical role in the pathogenesis of uh, idiopathic PAP or autoimmune PAP. So like finally he's saying like autoantibodies are there and they have uh, they used to like uh, produce disease. So the level of GMCSF autoantibodies level until a, it, there is a level of GMCSF autoantibodies after which it uh, caused to create disease. We, uh, he's saying like even a healthy pay, uh, person used to have some GMCSF autoantibodies, but after a critical uh, threshold, if level used to increase, then it causes disease. So the, this demonstrated that GMCSF autoantibodies were pathognomic and lead to change the name from idiopathic pep to autoimmune pep. You know the pathogenesis of hereditary pep is caused by the recessive mutation. In the we know like uh, CSF2RA and CSF2RV gene. So these are the important genes. Now we will come to secondary pep. A heterogeneous group of underlying disease include like uh, there could be like hematologic disorders, uh, which like primarily myelodysplasia, which are like most important. So 76 to 88 percent cases are because of hematological disorder. After that comes infectious diseases like HIV, then autoimmune uh, diseases, then immunosuppression after uh, organ transplant. So like uh, after that comes non-hematological malignancies. That in the secondary pep also occur in heavy inhalation of the inorganic dust, like silicosis, titanium exposure, aluminum exposure, or other gases and fumes. So they can also cause it uh, pulmonary artery, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. So they are telling like caused by reduction in number or clearance capacity of alveolar macrophages consistent with macrophage depletion. So either like macrophage depletion will be there or they will like reduce the number of macrophage or clearance capacity will be reduced of macrophage. So this is like main pathology in the secondary pulmonary, uh, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. Now we'll come to congenital pep. Congenital pep used to occur in neonates, infants, and children because it is, it is present since birth. Defect will be there in gene encoding surfactant protein B, surfactant protein C, ABCA3 gene, which is a lipid transporter expressed in the type 2 alveolar epithelial cells. After that comes TTF1, transcription, thyroid transcription factor 1, which help in development of lung and surf, surfactant expression. They are telling in contrast to primary and secondary pep that are caused by reduced surfactant clearance. These disorders result in production of abnormal surfactant. So congenital pep used to be occur by production of abnormal surfactant, while primary and secondary pep are related to reduced surfactant clearance, which is important thing. So primary and secondary are due to deficiency in clearance, and congenital pep is due to deficiency in the production of abnormal uh, due to production of abnormal surfactant. Okay. Now we'll come to clinical features. So they are telling like uh, autoimmune pep, we know like primary pep, typically present as progressive dyspnea. Very important. So like dyspnea will be like classical feature of insidious onset. In previously healthy adults between the age of 20 to 50 years. So, like this is the most common age where it uh, which this disease involves. So, this will be there, like most of the in most of the cases, after that comes fatigue, then cough, then comes the fever, and sputum production will be there in one to four percent cases. They're telling a history of diffuse pneumonia, poorly responsive or unresponsive to antibiotic therapy is usually elicited, and a history should raise the suspicion of PEP. So, like if diffuse pneumonia, which is not resolving with the help of antibiotic, so we should suspect pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. There will be uh, inspiratory crackles will be there, cyanosis will be there because of hypoxia and like they are telling an autoimmune pep clubbing will be typically absent. So this is like thing what we have to learn. 
So one thing is like uh, dyspnea will be like most common symptom. Second thing is like uh, clavic is typically absent in autoimmune pep. That telling like in secondary pep, uh, secondary pep uh, ka median age he is telling like four, uh, 49 years. Most frequently accompanied with adjustment dyspnea will be there like as uh, it was happening in autoimmune pep also. But it is followed by fever. So like fever will be more common in the in the case of uh, secondary pep. So this thing we have to learn. So fever will be like second most uh, clinical feature. While fatigue was second most clinical feature in the case of autoimmune pep. They are telling in congenital pep, dyspnea will be there, crackles will be there, but digital clubbing will be common. So this thing is also important. Like digital clubbing will be common in the case of uh, congenital pep. So now we will come to radiological appearance. So in chest x-ray, there will be diffuse bilateral alveolar opacities, often with a perihilar predominance. Like it will be more common in the region, uh, in the perihilar region. Okay. So there will be diffuse bilateral alveolar opacities, often with a perihilar predominance, resembling the bat wing appearance. So bat wing appearance will be like more common. Of pulmonary edema, it will look like of pulmonary edema, but without other sign of left-sided heart failure. There will be no other sign of left-sided heart failure, but bad wing appearance will be there. Then we should raise suspicious uh, suspicion of like uh, it could be pap. Now he is telling like peripheral lung is sometimes spared. So periphery will be spared, resulting in lucency along the diaphragmatic, mediastinal, or peripheral borders. So there will be lucency in the peripheral areas. Now he is explaining the finding of HRCT, which has characteristic geographic pattern of ground glass opacity nodules. Very very important. Geographic pattern of ground glass opacity reflecting the filling of secondary lobule, we know. With superimposed interlobular septal or interlobular septal thickening will be there. Very important. Septal thickening will be there. Geographic pattern of ground glass opacity will be there, which refer to crazy paving appearance, which is characteristic. But it is not a diagnostic of PEP. It could be in other conditions also, crazy paving. It could be in like acute silicosis also. But yeah, it will be there in PEP. So here we can see uh, this is the chest x ray, which is showing wet wing appearance in the perihilar region. So very important. And uh, there will be like sparing of these like uh, diaphragmatic borders, periphery not involved. And like uh, he is telling like diaphragmatic sparing will be there. Here we can see. So yeah, this is the appearance in chest X-ray. Now here we can see in the uh, CT. In CT there will be like geographic like uh, there is like uh, involvement of nodular opacity here, here, in this part. But like few parts are not involved. Like this part is not involved. This part is not involved. And there will be like inter and intra lobular septal thickening will be there. Here we can see this is the septal thickening. This is the septal thickening. This is the septal thickening. This is the subtle thickening, and there will be like a sparing of the periphery. This like peripheral part is not involved. This peripheral part is not involved. Now we'll come to lab parameters. They are telling like in primary PEP, routine investigation will be normal, like WBC counts, hemoglobin, everything will be normal, except LDH, which is raised two three times, and correlate well with the degree of functional impairment. So it uh, it will uh, correlate with the uh, degree of functional in, uh, impairment. So it will raise two three times. LDH will be raised two three times. In autoimmune PEP, including increased uh, serum level of GM CSF, autoantibodies will be there. Obviously, this is autoimmune condition, so and autoantibody will be there. Uh, they are telling like surfactant protein A, surfactant protein B, surfactant protein D, KL6, CEA, uh, Cypra 21.1, Cytocritin 19. So these things will be there. They are telling many of these biomarkers, biomarkers are also raised in hereditary PEP. Importantly, serum GM CSF is specifically elevated in hereditary PEP, but not in on the autoimmune PEP, obviously. Uh, we know that uh, we know like uh, GM CSF level will be reduced in uh, autoimmune PEP because there will be auto antibodies against GM CSF. But in hereditary PEP, GM CSF is not acting on the receptors. So if it is not acting on the receptors, then its level will be increased in the hereditary PEP. So in a hereditary PEP, the level of GM CSF will be raised. While in autoimmune, as we know, there will be auto antibodies against GM CSF. So GM CSF level will be reduced. Now we'll come to lung function. As we know, in primary PEP. Usually it is like normally normal, but in like a later case, it can involve, it can lead to like restrictive pattern and uh, impairment of a reduction in the vital capacity TLC and DLCO. So as we know, it can lead to restrictive lung disease. So uh, it is a kind of restric restrictive lung disease. So in AVG, we can see like hypoxia and like raised alveolar arterial diffusion gradient. Now they are telling about the bronchoscopic examination and bronchoscopic appearance is normal, but like uh, their bronchi, the airway will be normal, but there could be a presence of white frothy proteinaceous material will be there, which is occasionally seen. Bowel fluid will be opaque, has milky or waxy appearance, very important. Frothy proteinosis will be there and waxy and uh, milky appearance will be there, which lead to a uh, development of thick layer of sediment upon standing overnight. If we will put that fluid standing overnight, then it can lead to thick layer of sediment. The sediment consists of large acellular eosinophilic bodies in diffuse background of granular material, which stand with the pass. And they are telling the cellular Fraction contain large foamy macrophages. A smaller monocyte like macrophages could be there, lymphocyte could be there with relatively few neutrophils, unless infection is also present. So, like large foamy macrophage will be there in the cellular fraction, and large acellular eosinophilic bodies will be there in the sediment. They are telling surfactant protein level are increased 
obviously we know that surfactant proteins are there in this and electron microscopy reveal presence of laminal bodies and tubular myelin that are characteristic of the surfactant very very important so in electron microscopy we can see that there will be laminar bodies and tubular myelin the presence of uh, laminar bodies and tubular myelin will be there which is characteristic of the surfactant if they are present then we can like find that it is because of surfactant and if surfactant proteins are higher then we can like we should think of like we should uh, it could be diagnostic of uh, pap now we'll come to microscopically uh, what will be there in gross specimen there is a cut surface of lung in autoimmune pap reveal a patch work of 2 to 3 cm gray yellow region of consolidation excluding a oily substance oily substance will be there because of the proteinaceous and uh, uh, phospholipid that telling microscopically alveoli are filled with granular eosinophilic material as we know that is strength strongly with surfactant protein obviously in primary pap the alveolar wall interstitial architecture are usually well preserved obviously in parenchymal lymphocytosis also present okay parenchymal lymphocytes this will be there and later in the disease it can lead to pulmonary fibrosis so like pulmonary fibrosis can be visible vasculature will be normal like, because it is not a disease of vasculature and like again he is telling in electron microscopy alveolar uh, macrophages will be there uh, which will be like they are telling like, concentrically laminated surfactant bodies will be there within the granular material and smaller single membrane uh, delimited intracytoplasmic vesicle containing esterified cholesterol will be there so like here we can see uh, there are like four diagrams first one is Uh, ball fluid ka we are seeing like ball fluid and which is positive of pass like stand with the pass this one the second one is like a typical foamy alveolar macrophage very important this is like this is any like fat particles we can see so this is like foamy macrophage third one is like a uh, histologic appearance of lung biopsy here we can see this is the lung biopsy which is having like homogeneous staining pattern and normal alveolar wall architecture and there is there is no inflammation inflammatory cells are not there so this is not a inflammatory disease so inflammation will be not there like fourth thing this uh, last one is uh, like immunohistological uh, immunohistochemical staining reveals the presence of abundant accumulation of surfactant protein a in the lung biopsy so it is revealing like uh, there is deposition of uh, surfactant protein a this these things like brownish color now we'll come to second infection so like second infections are very common in these uh, pap cases so they include nocardia here you can see this is nocardia mycobacterial infection will be there aspergillosis cryptococcus will be there infection can occur in both primary uh, pulmonary and external site uh, can be like at anywhere infection could be there because it is a systemic condition which is involving like reduce uh, efficacy of uh, macrophages reduce signaling to of uh, uh, formation of uh, macrophages supporting that concept that systemic effect defect in the host defense is present second due to defect in antimicrobial function of macrophages and neutrophil now we'll come to diagnosis so like history is very important then physical examination radiological lung function finding will be there so because of these things we can rule out like what are the differential diagnosis so differential diagnosis will be like hypersensitivity pneumonitis very important pulmonary edema could be there pneumonia could be there interstitial lung disease could be there so they are telling radiological abnormalities in pap are increased out of proportion of severity then we should suspect uh, suspected on the clinical ground like they are telling like radiological abnormality will be there but clinically patient will be not that uh, deteriorated so this is like very important thing so radiological abnormality in pap are increased out of the proportion of suspected clinical uh, disease they are telling like traditionally trans initially we used to do uh, trans bronchial or surgical uh, biopsies but they are not diagnostic and uh, they are not like even adequate to diagnose this condition so they are telling like the serum based gm csf auto antibodies and the elisa found to have a sensitivity and specificity of a diagnosis of autoimmune pap approaching 100% so like these elisa test uh, that like detect gm csf auto antibodies are like having sensitivity and specificity of 100% very important so we should like go for these things now they are telling like measurement of gm csf signaling in fni blood by state 5 phosphorylation in leuc uh, leukocytes also uh, useful in differential diagnosis of pap in increase in serum G gm csf is a sensitive method for diagnosis of hereditary pap very important so we know like in hereditary pap gm csf level used to increase so here we can see gm csf also and also abnormal state 5 phosphorylation will be there because signaling is defective in this hereditary pap they are telling secondary pap can usually be distinct, uh, distinguished from primary pap on the clinical context, uh, context. and they are telling pap disease mimics pneumocystis uh, pneumonia so by the help of special histochemical stains we can differentiate pneumocystis pneumonia and uh, pap pulmonary alveolar proteinosis they are telling like in primary pap therapy is required in most of the cases like in primary uh, pap therapy means like a uh, whole lung lavage or wll so wll is required in most of the cases in the primary pap but not all the patient is usually initiated with symptoms we can limit it uh, limit it uh, then secondary pap treatment is in at the underlying clinical so we should treat the underlying condition in the case of secondary pap and although wll can be effective like whole lung lavage can be effective in congenital pap therapy generally limited to supportive care like it is very uh, 
tough to treat congenital prep but uh, and like we should go for supportive care although they are telling like suspected protein b deficiency can be treated successfully in lung transplant cases but like most of the cases are treated with the help of supportive care only now we will come to whole lung lavage most widely used therapy of the for the primary cases primary uh, pap cases and still recommended standard approaches this is like a recommended standard approach it can be helpful in secondary pap but has little to no utility in congenital pap as we have discussed earlier likely due to extensive parenchymal derangement will be there in the congenital pap so it is not helpful in the case of congenital pap very important so we use it most of uh, the cases of uh, primary pap and in few cases of secondary pap they are telling what are the indication of initiation of whole lung lavage therapy so they are telling like histopathological diagnosis of pap should be there pao2 level should be less than 60 mm hg so hypoxia should be there alveolar arterial oxygen gradient should be more than uh, 40 and they are telling like sun fraction should be more than 10 to 12 percent and severe dyspnea at the rest or with exercise so these are like one two three four five five criteria they are like histopathological diagnosis of pap should be there pao2 level should be less than 60 mm hg alveolar arterial oxygen gradient should be more than 40 mm hg sun fraction should be more than 10 to 12 percent and like severe dyspnea at rest or with the exercise should be there now they are telling it should be done with the help of general anesthesia and there should be separate endotracheal intubation to isolate lung so we should do endotracheal intubation and isolate each lung like if we are doing wll to right lung then we should isolate uh, left lung with the help of endotracheal intubation and simultaneous mechanical ventilation of one lung while repeatedly filling and draining to the other lung with the warm saline warm saline we use warm saline to like uh, lavage with or without percussion to emulsify or physically remove the alveolar surfactant they are telling we should infuse the volume of 50 liter per lung in our adult and we should return about 20 to 30 liter of the fluid with the help of 50 liter fluid other variation include use of extracorporeal or hyperbaric oxygen we can use and whether the lung are both whether uh, the lungs are both treated on the same day or different day we can use these things while a specific therapeutic response criteria has not been defined most patient experience clinical uh, physiological radiological improvement will be there after whole lung lavage and they are telling like physiological parameters to improve wll include an increase in the force vital capacity used to increase tlc dlco and po2 at rest, rest or exercise used to uh, increase and there will be decrease in this gradient and sun fraction used to be decreased and they are telling like duration of response to wll is 15 months so response used to come in 15 months low bar lavage performed during bronchoscopy is an alternative to whole lung lavage if patient is intolerant to whole lung lavage so we can do also like low bar lavage could be there so here this is the last picture which is showing like initially when we have started the uh, whole wll so this is like of this is starting the wll so this is like very thick fluid and proteinaceous fluid and having like foamy uh, bubbles are there but uh, this right bottle is uh, this is right bottle which is during the end of the procedure like which has removed most of the proteins and uh, has cleared the fluid a lot so this is the improvement after wll thank you very much